one of the questions I'm most often asked is, um, is why don't I despair? Um, given that my job basically consists of rolling in the excrement of humanity, and I'm not just referring to my recent encounter with Piers Morgan, um, uh, you know, how do I get out of bed in the morning, you know, considering I have to engage with all the terrible things that are going on around the world? And the, the truth is that, yes, yeah, sometimes I do. I mean, there is a lot to despair over. One of the um, rather alarming revelations I had last year was that climate breakdown, and I call it climate breakdown because calling it climate change is like calling an invading army unexpected visitors. <laughs> it's such a ridiculously neutral and passive term for the existential crisis we face. Uh, climate change is only the third most urgent environmental issue that we confront. This is not because it's become any less urgent, far from it, but because I realise that two other issues are happening with even greater speed and force than climate breakdown is happening. And that, uh, those are the ecological cleansing of both the land and the sea by the food industry. The extraordinarily rapid destruction of whole ecosystems, of the species that inhabit those e ecosystems, of, of the ecological structure and function of, of those places, and also often of the very physical resources upon both which, uh, upon, uh, both, uh, upon which both ecosystems and human survival are based. And to give you one classic example of this, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization says that at current rates of soil loss, we have 60 years of harvest left. Now, <coughs> civilizations can suffer famines, wars, plagues, and be knocked back, but they can bounce back from those disasters. But you lose your soil and there is no coming back at all. You have lost the basis for human life and much of the other life on this planet. Um, and that's just one of the resources currently at great risk. So we have a multiple, manifold ecological crisis meshing with an economic crisis a crisis of patrimonial wealth. Um, Thomas Piketty described it very well, but he called it misleadingly patrimonial capitalism because actually, uh, um, or patrimonial capital, most of what is being secured by the 1% is wealth rather than capital. It's stuff which nobody made. It's stuff which wasn't created for, for, for productive purposes, particularly land. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to how much property wealth the 1% in this country have on average? About 600,000 people in that category. 15 million pounds in property wealth. And that's where the real inequality is. It's not so much in income, it's in wealth. And that capture of wealth, alongside the capture of much of social production by the extremely rich, not only deprives other people of wealth, but also greatly distorts the whole basis of the economy. The economy effectively begins to shift from being an enterprise economy to a rentier economy, where the very rich are living off the economic rents which they extract from the rest of us while doing almost no work. Um, now, I define economic rent, and there are several different, often confusing, confusing um, definitions, but I define it as using your exclusive control over a non-reproducible resource in order to charge excessive fees. So a classic example of this is a train journey I've just taken. <laughs> now I know that part of the money that I paid for my ticket will go on rolling stock and fuel and staffing costs, but a big part of that money, I don't know quite how much, but probably a fairly substantial wodge of it will go for the fact that they have me over a barrel. There's only one train company working that line and they can charge pretty well what they want for me to come down here to Falmouth. So that part of the ticket price, which represents their monopoly position, is economic rent. That is money which they have unfairly taken from me, not for offering a service, but because uh, they've got me where they want me. Now, um, confusingly again, when you pay rent for a home, 
Part of that money is going to be compensating the landlord or the landlady or the company or whatever it is, the university, um, for the um, uh, for the, the cost of um, buying the house and for any repairs that they're doing, but also because it is in effect a non-reproducible resource in that there can only be one home in one location and that some locations are much more desirable than others, you're going to be paying over the odds because basically they've got you where, you, where, where they want you, not least because there's a housing shortage in Britain anyway. So, and by this means, those who have money make an awful lot more money without having to put in any effort. And they take that money from everyone else. Far from wealth trickling down, wealth is grabbed by the very rich and accumulated. And this system of wealth accumulation has been greatly enhanced by the um, ideology that has led to the next crisis, which is the political crisis. And this, the dominant ideology of our times, is best called neoliberalism, which was the term originally given to it by its founders, people like Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman. They were all happy to call themselves neoliberals until suddenly they realised it was better not to call themselves anything and just claim that they were describing a natural system which functioned a bit like Darwinian evolution and that um, they weren't even ha it wasn't even an economic theory they were proposing, they were just describing the world as it is. And at the core of neoliberal thought is the notion that our relationships should be transactional, that we exist in relation to each other through buying and selling. And that that process of buying and selling, of treating the whole of society as if it were a corporation, in effect, determines who the natural winners are and who the natural losers are. It creates what they say is a natural hierarchy, a scala natura of virtue. And those who have striven and worked hardest, they become the very rich, and those who are deviant and undeserving become the very poor. And any process, political or social process, which tries to interfere with the discovery of this natural hierarchy of winners and losers is illegitimate. That applies to taxation, that applies to regulation, <coughs> that applies to trade unions. In fact, that applies to politics in general. Politics is um, determined to be an illegitimate sphere by neoliberalism because it's the market this um, um, transfer of wealth between people, which is the only means by which decisions, decisions should be made. And this market, well, it turns out not to be a force of nature. It turns out to be something controlled by human beings and controlled primarily by those who've got the most money. And so what this sort of impersonal force, which was meant to be making these decisions, in practice turns out to be actually a highly personal force of oligarchs who are using the opportunity of escaping from politics, escaping from democracy, massively to enrich themselves. And by cutting those public protections which defend workers, which defend citizens, which defend the living world, by cutting taxes, by destroying trade unions, they have managed to free themselves from democracy and free themselves to become immensely wealthy which is what is driving this tremendous growth in inequality that we see today. And, and driving also the cycle of patrimonial wealth accumulation, that once you've got money you can make much more, and there's nothing then to stop you if politics can no longer intervene. And this creates, in turn, a political crisis. Because if politics says our role is to stand back, if the government says our role is no longer to govern, if the state says we must shrink the state, then there is no means by which social outcomes can be altered. Social mobility stalls, um, the redistribution of wealth stalls, and, there, um, and basically politics can no longer change uh, what happens in people's lives. So it therefore becomes irrelevant to them. And people perceive politics as being the yabba of a remote elite going on above their heads rather than being something which makes any sense to their lives at all. And so people then turn to an anti-politics, 
a politics characterised by symbols and slogans and sensation rather than by argument and by fact and by rational discourse. A politics which says, come and belong to us and that's all you need to do. Then you will be the elect, you will be the dominant people and you will crush the losers, the undeserving. And, and this is, is what we see with the rise of demagoguery taking place now around the world. It's not just Trump, it's Modi in India, it's Duterte in the Philippines, it's Erdogan in Turkey, it's Orban in Hungary and many others besides. This, this new age of demagoguery seems to be beginning and it could very easily start to shade into a new fascism. We're already beginning to see the stirrings of fascism with its virulent racism and misogyny um, and really hatred of all difference, hatred of all gentleness, hatred of all kindness. We're, we're starting to see something I never thought I would see in my lifetime, the resurgence of this smashed, discredited idea which is now, because of the political vacuum, because of the complete <coughs> failure of politics to provide answers for people because of the grip of neoliberalism, is returning. So we have a, a crisis on many levels. And in, in many ways this crisis interlocks. Neoliberalism is driving environmental destruction as well because when you strip away public protections for the living world, there's nothing to stop them. Why wouldn't they chop down the forest? Why wouldn't they sieve all the fish out of the sea if no one's saying you can't? Um, and, and of course, the economic and political crises reinforce each other in a vicious spiral. So you can look at all that and say, yes, there's plenty of cause for despair. But on the whole, I do not despair. Just sometimes I have, I have my moments but I don't despair because of the fundamental recognition that's dri driven me for many years, which is that political failure is at heart a failure of imagination. If you are staring at the wall and you cannot see any cracks in the wall, it's not because the cracks aren't there. In politics, there is always cracks in the wall. It's because you're not looking at it right. And sometimes you have to stand back, look at it in a different light, Use your imagination, expand your mind, and you will start to see those cracks. And this conviction, for me, has been reinforced over the past two or three years by four observations. And I don't claim that they're original to me. Possibly one and a half are sort of. Um, but um, but, uh, but uh, others are commonplace. Um, and, and these strongly suggest to me that there is everything to play for. The first of these observations is that it is not political parties or political leaders who run the world and create major political change, but big political narratives. If you look at the history of the past 70 or 80 years, for example, you'll find it roughly um, split down the middle between two big political narratives, Keynesian social democracy and neoliberalism. Um, and at the height of both of those doctrines, they became almost universal. When Keynesian social democracy um, was the dominant doctrine, particularly in what the French call the, the, the Trente Glorieuse between 1945 and 1975, in Richard Nixon's words, we are all, near, we are all, sorry, we are all Keynesians now. They, it became the common sense right across politics. It didn't matter whether you were Democrat or Republican, Labour or Conservative, it didn't matter what your roots were, what your colours were, you became a Keynesian. And then when that ran into trouble in the late 1970s and the neoliberals turned up, over the course of a few years, almost everyone became neoliberal. New Labour, the Democrats, they became neoliberal. Again, it didn't matter what your, your supposed political persuasion was, it was the narrative that dominated. And perhaps there's nothing surprising about this because we are fundamentally creatures of narrative. We interpret the world through stories. And we do so because the world is too complex to interpret by other means. The sense we seek is not the sense that mathematicians or scientists or philosophers recognise, it's narrative sense. 
instead of facing this stream of data which is coming at us all the time and saying, right, well, this data on that side says this and this on that side says this. Um, now, what do I think the probability of this being correct? And We just can't work like that. It's too much happening. Our minds are too complex. The minds of other people are too complex. We can't process all the stuff which is going on inside us and around us in terms of data gathering and data processing. So we need a heuristic, a shortcut. And the story is a shortcut that we have used for hundreds of thousands of years um, to make sense of the world. And so what we're listening for is, does this have a beginning and a middle and an end? Does it progress as I would expect it to progress? Does it show us how we got to where we are, where we now stand, where we're likely to go, what it's going to be like when we get there? Is there a hero? Do they triumph? All these sort of things, these, these are the narratives that we're listening out for. You cannot take away someone's story without giving them a new one. If you try to confront a story with facts and figures, they will just bounce off you, bounce off it, because uh, the only thing that can displace a story is a story. And this leads to the second observation, which becomes more interesting, which is that though Keynesian social democracy and neoliberalism are polar opposites to each other, they use exactly the same narrative structure. And this is the structure I call the restoration story. And I believe that our minds are tuned not just to narratives in general, but to particular structures. And this one is a very powerful structure. And it goes as follows. The land has been thrown into disorder by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humanity. But the hero of the story, who might be one person or a group of people or even an institution, will take on those powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrow them and restore order to the land. It's the Lord of the Rings story, it's the Narnia story, you've seen it a thousand times. Uh, and, and it turns out that both of those stories use that structure. So, Keynesian social democracy says, the land has been thrown into disorder by the powerful and nefarious forces of the economic elite, who through the 19th and early 20th centuries accumulated all the wealth, all the social production for themselves, depriving other people of their means of subsistence, throwing them into destitution and debt, destroying consumer demand, thereby undermining the economy and causing the Great Depression. But the hero of the story, the enabling state, supported by the working and middle classes, will fight back against these powerful and nefarious forces, will tax them heavily, will use that money to spend back into the public sphere, creating robust public services, a strong social safety net, in doing so, will create circulation, employment, which in turn will create consumer demand, which in turn will create wealth, and order will be restored to the land. The neoliberal story says, the land has been thrown into disorder by powerful and nefarious forces in the form of the collectivizing state. And even though it may seem benign in its first instances, like in the British, social, uh, uh, British welfare state or the American New Deal, it inevitably leads us down the road to serfdom because that, that very process of trying to manage people as a whole through public services, through the welfare state, will lead to the suppression of individuality and freedom and opportunity and that leads inexorably to totalitarianism in the form of Stalinism or Nazism. But the hero of the story, the freedom-seeking entrepreneur, will fight these powerful and nefarious forces and by using the, fr using the market um, and by opening that sphere and pushing back against the collectivizing tendencies of the state will liberate people and allow them to express individuality and opportunity of the kind they haven't had um, during this era and will therefore restore order to the land. Two opposite narratives with the same narrative structure. 
Which led me to the third observation, which is that just about every successful political or religious transformation there has ever been has used that narrative structure. The restoration story is absolutely fundamental. And, and, that the, um, <coughs> and that without that restoration story, it's very hard to create the political or religious transformation. It's the absolutely fundamental, necessary but insufficient condition, because of course there's other things you need to do as well, but it is a necessary condition of transforming or mutating from one dispensation to another. You need to tell the story. And that led me to the fourth observation, which is that the reason we are stuck now with neoliberalism is that we have failed to tell a new restoration story. After the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes sat down, wrote his general theory, and he told very effectively, with brilliant panache, um, a new restoration story which was completely different from the prevailing ethic uh, that he was contesting. While during the Keynesian era, the neoliberals quite consciously and deliberately set out to write a story of their own. And over the course of 30 years, they polished it and polished it, and they were ready. They were waiting, as Milton Friedman said, with um, great prescience. He said, within about 30 years, Keynesianism is going to run into major trouble. We're going to bide our time. When the time is ripe, we will step forward and we will have it ready made and just be able to hand it over. And this is exactly what they did. In the late 1970s, they stepped forward and said, uh, OK, that old model has failed. Here's a new one on a plate. Oh, thanks very much, Gov. Oh, thank God there's another story. You know? and, so, and it was, and it was j just, just taken up, ad adopted when, you know, during the Keynesian crises of the 1970s. In 2008, neoliberalism implodes, completely collapses. The whole story that the markets can regulate themselves, that the less governments interfere, the better it'll be for everyone, <coughs> that wealth will trickle down from the rich to the poor, that whole thing was just fundamentally disproved. Even Alan Greenspan, one of the, the, the most determined neoliberal advocates of all, was forced to admit there was a flaw. <laughs> And so, at this crucial um, um, inflection point, the opponents of neoliberalism step forward with nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. No new restoration story at all. Just complete. They hadn't even recognised that there was a need for one. And all that people proposed was either, um, can we have a slightly less virulent neoliberalism, please? Or, or why don't we go back to Keynesianism? Well, one of the problems with politics is that you can't go back. It's very difficult. Unless you're a fascist, for some reason fascists are able to go back. <laughs> um, but, but by and large, it's very hard to revive and disinter an idea which has already um, had its sort of span of life, 30 or 40 years lifespan, which is about the longest that any story will last in politics. It's very hard to go back, partly because we like to distance ourselves from our parents' generation a little bit, but... I also made perhaps primarily because one of two things is likely to happen during the first lifespan of, of that politics. Either its internal contradictions will emerge and it basically implodes, as neoliberalism did, or um, its opponents will find very effective means over the years of destroying it, which is what happened to Keynesianism. Because with Keynesianism, you have to have capital controls, you have to have fixed foreign exchange rates, you have to have a balanced global trading system to make it work. Keynes was highly aware of this. Well, the balanced global trading system never got off the ground. Um, he tried and tried at Bretton Woods to push for the International Clearing Union. It was scotched by the Americans. Um, the capital controls and fixed foreign exchange rates were torn down, um, starting in the 1950s, actually. And, and the idea that you know, we could ever go back to that and that the opponents of it might have forgotten how they destroyed it the first time round <coughs> is, is just, I think, stretching the bounds of probability. Um, or the idea that we can operate without those essential prerequisites, well, we've seen what's happened. Um, in 2008, the government introduced um, scrappage fees, uh, scra 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 scrappage payments, so you could trade in your old car 
and be given £2,000 towards the cost of a new car. And this was meant to be a classic Keynesian stimulus measure to get the economy working again. Um, and um, you know, the idea being that people buy new cars, so people are, are going to be employed um, uh, uh, manufacturing those cars, um, and um, therefore they're going to spend more money into the economy and the rest of it. Uh, well, yes, um, it worked very well in Germany and Japan, because only 15% of the cars that we buy are manufactured in this country, or even assembled in this country. And so this was a lovely foreign aid package that we gave <laughs> to Germany and Japan, because without capital controls, you can't keep it inside your own country. And with EU state aid rules and the rest of it, you couldn't discriminate, b b discriminate between them. So uh, globalization of capital has made Keynesianism effectively impossible. But there's a third reason why Keynesianism cannot or should not be disinterred. And that is that at its heart is the notion of stimulus spending or deficit spending, the purpose of it being to sustain a steady rate of economic growth. Now, sustaining a steady rate of economic growth would be just fine and dandy. There'd be no problem with it at all if the planet were also growing at the same rate. But sadly, the planet is not. And so perpetual economic growth on a finite planet leads inevitably to the bursting of planetary boundaries. And that's what we're seeing right now. Those environmental crises that I'm talking about are crises driven by economic activity pushing through the ecological boundaries uh, that, that enable um, a, a, a safe um, space for, 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 for humanity to inhabit. Um, and this is happening with current levels of economic activity. Now the IMF and the World Bank and people say, oh, we're not trying to be unreasonable. All we want is a steady 3% global growth rate. That means a doubling <coughs> every 24 years. So we double in 24 years from now, and then we quadruple in a further 24 years, and then it's eight times in a further 24 years, and it's 16 times in a further 24 years. Which planets are we going to harness to support that growth? How on earth can it be sustained when we can't even support current levels of economic activity? And it very soon becomes apparent that an inherently growth-based system like Keynesianism simply can't deliver the safe and just world in which we want to live. So we need a new story, a new restoration story, a story that tells us how we got here, where we now stand, what the future holds and what it's going to be like when we get there. A story that lights a path to a better world. A story based on fact, because there's no point in basing it on fairy tales, as I believe the neoliberals have done. This sounds like a tall order, but I believe such a story is waiting to be told. And it goes something like this. The land has been thrown into disorder <laughs> by the powerful and nefarious forces of neoliberal politicians and economists and journalists who have torn society apart, who have atomized and ruled, who have told us that there is no such thing as society, that our role is a noble role of fighting like stray dogs over a dustbin, that our lives should be defined by competition and extreme individualism. And in doing so, they have damaged human society, damaged the living planet, undermined the basis of, of commonwealth and common decency. But we, the heroes of this story, will fight back against these powerful and nefarious forces by rebuilding community, by creating what I call a politics of belonging. Gen um, generous, inclusive communities, but communities built with a geographical basis, not just online communities, not just broad communities of interest, those two, yes, but, uh, but primarily Communities where you have a sense of <coughs> geographical belonging. Not exclusive belonging, not like us kind of people with four generations in the churchyard belong there and new incomers don't, but a place where anyone can belong even if they're just there for six months. And in that revitalised community, we see the stirrings of new democratic power, 
and of new economic power arising from the people, no longer controlled by the elite. And in doing so, we restore order to the land. This might take some unpacking. <laughs> so I'm going to do so because we have merely an hour, and, um, and I'm not quite up to a Fidel Castro-style speech this evening. Um, I'm going to do so by way of picking out one or two examples to give you an idea of the sort of thing I mean. And I think that a key task we face is to rebuild genuine, thriving, vibrant communities, partly because it is essential for our mental health, that the extreme alienation that we suffer in so many levels converges into psychic rupture, which I think a lot of people are now suffering, but partly also, if we don't get there first, the fascists will. Hannah Arendt pointed out that fascism arises from atomized societies. It is in the dust and powder of a shattered society where people have no sense of belonging, that they find that sense of belonging in fascism. <coughs> because fascism, at, at heart, is offering a community a very tight community where you wear the same u uniforms and you march to the same music and you stamp on the same heads. And it tells you that you, the, the insider community, are the dominant virtuous people and everyone else is to be crushed and destroyed because they have no virtue. And what draws people in is this sense that you are literally marching together. Unless you create a generous and inclusive community the alternative is not no community, because we can't stand that. We're so socially minded that we cannot live without community. The alternative is a, an ugly, exclusive and cruel community. And so I think it's an urgent necessity to start rebuilding communities that work. And the reason why I think they should, at least in part, be geographically based um, actual communities attached to place is, is that um, that gives people this fundamental sense of belonging which is absolutely key to our well-being and key to determining what it is that we fight for. You look at the people of Sheffield, they are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them now are fighting for their trees. They're not fighting for the trees somewhere else in Britain, they're fighting for the trees in Sheffield because they feel a sense of belonging to, with and in those trees and, and the city that the trees represent to them. And so they will put their liberty on the line in order to defend those trees because they have that investment in their geographical community. And it's very easy for us as sort of internationalists, as people with a sort of wide cosmopolitan view to say, well, we shouldn't you know, just focus on one place. Um, you know, we should be looking at the plight of everyone, which is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean you don't also focus on the one place. So, so think globally, act locally, I believe, turns out to be an absolutely fundamental um, an important and true message. Um, so how do you revitalise communities in a situation of atomization? also a situation of very rapid turnover with people coming in and moving out? I mean, so many people I've met around the country, you know, they're pitched up in somewhere, they're only going to be there for a few months, they don't get to know anyone and start to feel very lonely. I want to live in a country where everyone has a sense of belonging however short their stay may be, because they can immediately plug into community activities, community groups, a sense of community, um, how, how, even if they're not going to be there for very long. And there's now a science, almost, of how to make this work, summarised in this wonderful 400-page report produced by Lambeth Borough Council in London, um, which um, basically looks around the world at um, what has worked and what has not worked. And what they find is that to create what they call a participatory culture, you need to have a mixture of activities, some of which are very complex and sort of involved, but a lot of which are what they call low threshold, low commitment activities, things that anyone 
regardless of their socioeconomic status, can just dip into or dip out of without any sense of threat, any sense of long-term obligation, any sense of having to have a particular skill set um, or particular connections to do that. The classic one is eating together. Anyone here know the etymology of the word companion? Companes, with bread. This is a fundamental aspect of our humanity, eating together. Sitting in front of a TV with a microwave wheel that you're stuffing into your face doesn't count. Yeah, and, and really we have to reclaim that lost art. And it's not difficult. And of course there's wonderful um, projects like the one set up by the Eden Project called The Big Lunch. Um, 18 million people in Britain participated in it last year where um, for a day in June you um, put either tables down the street or you use a, a, a large space if it's raining um, and you basically everyone brings their food and you might bring some music to play and, um, and various other things but you eat together and you get to know your neighbours that way. Really fundamental thing. But there's also there's shared childcare, there's shared bulk buying, there's shared making and mending stuff. A lot of things which you can just dip into, dip out of. These are very important. But you need some anchors as well. You need some focal points. And a classic example they point to is um, something that happened in Rotterdam in 2011. Now Rotterdam is a big post-industrial dock city with a lot of problems, um, a lot of divided communities, um, a lot of balkanisation. But um, these sort of anarcho-punk types set up a little festival in a disused Turkish bathhouse and they called it, th they called it the Reading Room. And uh, they had uh, put on plays and films and gigs and um, there was a bar, there was a cafe, there were hangout spaces and it was wildly popular. And people persuaded them to keep it running after the week that this festival was supposed to run for. And so they turned it into a permanent fixture. And then someone said, well, yeah, but if we're doing this, we need a creche. Oh, yeah, right, someone better set up a creche. What about the old people who can't get out of their homes and come here? Oh, yeah, someone better set up an outreach service for them. What about this? What about that? All these things started proliferating, started budding off this initial idea. It helped to spawn... 1,300 projects. Quite extraordinary. And it has transformed the face of Rotterdam. Um, and today, uh, uh, the council <coughs> makes no decision without consulting the community groups because it basically says, yeah, you guys know how to do this much better than we do. You've sorted it out. You've worked it out. But that's creating that participatory culture and, and what the um, study calls a thick network uh, basically, once you've reached 10 to 15 percent penetration, 10 to 15 percent of people engaging in community projects, you get this sudden takeoff, and it becomes the norm to engage, and it becomes a bit odd not to be involved in a community project. And then you have this it's a real sense, like you've seen in Rotterdam, of whoosh, everything just coming together and transforming the city. But you can take this further through various forms of participatory democracy and participatory economy to give people even more of a sense that their city or, or county belongs to them. And there are some lovely examples, for instance, um, in Iceland, um, in Reykjavik, the capital, um, and now um, uh, something like 60% of the population of the capital has taken place in this, taken part in this participatory democracy exercise, whereby you can, anyone can submit an idea for the improvement of the city. Um, everyone else in the city then votes on that idea. The most popular ones then get put forward to the council and the council has to make a very rapid decision as to whether it's going to adopt it or reject it with very good reasons. And it has just turned the city around. Again, it's been utterly transformative and there's this very strong sense now that it belongs to the people, not to the politicians. Even further down this line is um, the uh, thing which started in Porto Alegre in the south of Brazil and has now spread to several hundred cities around the world, um, which is participatory budgeting, where instead of you just handing over your tax money, your, your council tax, and the council says, right, we're going to spend this on that and this on that, and what have you, and it all becomes a bit opaque. 
and you don't really know what's going on and you don't really know if the right decisions are being made, the whole city sets the budget. They have these m masses of converging district meetings. Um, in practice, 50,000 people a year take part in the budgetary process. And the results have been spectacular. Um, if you compare Porto Alegre to similar cities in Brazil which don't use participatory budgeting, they've now got far better sanitation, far better water quality, many more nursery places, much better primary health care, much better education. Um, it just goes on and on. It's, it's, it's quite amazing how it has transformed the city, this sort of takeover by the people of the infrastructure budget. It's uh, destroyed the mafia there. The mafia has completely disappeared because what gives mafias their strength and their staying power is that they provide services which a corrupt and useless council is not providing. Um, it has wiped out corruption and it has produced something which political scientists will tell you is completely impossible. People lobbying for their taxes to be raised. <laughs> because they can see the point of public spending when they're in control. But even this, I feel, could go still further. And the stage I would like to move that thinking on to is the reclamation of the commons. Now, how many people here would be comfortable defining the commons? Very good. One. One's about average. So um, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do yourselves in because, because one is, is perfectly normal and an audience of this size. It, it is amazing. Um, the commons is one of the four basic pillars of the economy. But it's been so excluded from economics textbooks, from general discourse, that we don't even talk about it anymore. Not long ago, you know, a couple of hundred years, 300 years ago, most um, 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 property, most assets, most resources were held in common. There are, when we talk about politics and we place ourselves on the political spectrum, we do so along a single axis with state at one end and market on the other. And if you're on the left, you say you want more state and less market. If you're on the right, you say you want more market and less state. But there are four pillars, primary pillars to the economy. One of them is the household, or the core economy, as some people call it. And the perennial neglect of the household, which is absolutely fundamental to the functioning of the rest of the economy. You can't, you know, if children are not fed, watered, loved, Taken to school. Do you water children? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, maybe that's where I've been going wrong. Um, taken to school and all the rest of it. They cannot become functional adults and they can't participate in any other form of economic activity. And because we neglected this, we neglect the crucial economic role of women who are still the primary carers at the household level. A wonderful book by Catherine Marcel called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? And it turns out that while the great man was writing The Wealth of Nations, his mother was scurrying around, making his dinner, cleaning his clothes, making his bed and all the rest of it. And he completely ignores this massive economic contribution which made the writing of The Wealth of Nations possible. <laughs> the hands of his mother remained invisible. Um, and, and so he... he um, and, 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 you know, she points out that, you know, he simply could not have written that book and no one he was writing about in all these sort of macho activities of things involving hammers and water wheels or whatever could have happened if there wasn't a household behind them. So that's number three, pillar of the economy. Um, and then number four is the commons. What is a commons? A commons really consists of three elements. So this is my sort of very condensed definition. You could probably give a better one, but um, three elements, which is a resource, a particular resource. It might be a piece of land. It might be the water flowing off a hillside. It might be a forest. It might be a fishery. It might be some software. It might be an academic journal. Um, but it's, it's a particular resource. Second element which is controlled by a particular community. It's not, hell, it's not like everybody owns it. It's a particular group of people, <laughs> controls this resource, has possession in it, not necessarily um, sort of property ownership in the kind that we recognise today. And the third element is the rules and negotiations which that community produces in order to manage the resource. Any product from that resource is shared on an equitable basis amongst the members of this community. 
Now, as I suggest, you go back a few hundred years, and this was the dominant model. For land, almost all land was held in common. Our fundamental resource was held in common. And, and, and this was the case worldwide. The notion of private individual property was just, it was as crazy as the notion of owning a piece of air. It just did not figure in people's minds. It wasn't something which people even would have thought of as a thing, let alone as a legitimate thing. But the change began in England, as it happens, um, in the 16th century, um, with um, primarily following the dissolution of the monasteries, and, and people began acquiring private land ownership. Now, this had its upside in that with that came the notion of individual rights, which um, began to seed the notion of democratic rights and led eventually to the massive contest between the landowners and the crown, which culminated in the English Civil War. Following the English Civil War, they began grabbing more and more and more land because the crown had been pushed back and there was no real constraint on their ability to do so. And we saw the massive process of enclosure um, that transformed the face of Britain. As, they, um, as a small group of people grabbed what belonged to everybody. And while it helped to um, sow the seeds for parliamentary democracy, it also destroyed economic democracy or the prospects for economic democracy, which in turn then undermines parliamentary democracy, as we're now seeing, with this tremendous power of the encloser class, which we also call the 1%. Now, when I worked um, abroad, particularly in West Papua and Brazil and East Africa, I saw um, with my own eyes these enclosures taking place, people being deprived of their ancestral lands, um, uh, a few people grabbing that land, throwing the um, previous inhabitants off their land, who would then, well, really spiral into despair and dissolution, alienation, anomie, alcoholism, drug addiction, all those social ills basically followed from losing not just your livelihood, but your sense of belonging, your sense of place, your community and all the ceremonial and spiritual life invested in that community as well. The whole lot gets um, pulled from under you <coughs> and you are left um, with nothing except your fragmented, your shattered mind because we can't form a mind by ourselves. We have to form our minds with other people. We are this supremely social mammal with the possible exception of the naked mole rat, but we won't go into that now. <laughs> um, and it was only a few years after coming back to Britain that I started reading the poems of John Clare by, uh, I think, possibly our greatest English poet, this peasant, self-educated poet. And in his early um, adulthood, his youth and early adulthood, he describes this with great beauty, the, the, the nature that surrounds him, but also the community life and all the activities around the year that people engage in, the economic activities, the ceremonial activities, the community activities, and the fact that they weren't really separated. They were all mixed in to one, and you were just constantly engaging in community life in whatever you did. And it's a very rich and beautiful portrait he paints of what was going on in his parish. But then... In mid-adulthood, everything changes. And he starts writing poems like The Fallen Elm and The Moors and The Ballad of Sordi Well, which describe this complete shattering of that world as the enclosures come, come in, sweep everybody off the land, sweep all the features off the land as well. They cut down the trees, they destroy all the habitats, they drain the marshes and the rest of it. And then... Um, um, and put up fences, put up no trespassing signs, and put their sheep in where the people were. Sheep, I tell you, uh, sorry, that's another, that's, <laughs> sorry, wrong talk, wrong talk. Yeah. <laughs> right, um, um, uh, and, 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 and what happens to John Clare? He becomes an alcoholic, he loses his mind, he dies in a lunatic asylum. And it suddenly struck me, that happened to all of us regardless of where our ancestors came from in the world, because this model, which started in England, was spread to Ireland and then to Scotland, then to the British colonies, and then spread from the British colonies into the rest of the world. It has happened to everyone. And we wonder why we are so troubled. We wonder why we have 
such high rates of alcoholism, drug addiction, and all the other social pathologies that we can test with, we lost the commons. And in losing the commons, we lost ourselves. So how do we reclaim the commons? Well, I'll give you an example of how it could be done. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is something which I think is very close to the economic um, um, and social and political lives of everyone, which is urban land. Now, when I say urban land, I bet you start thinking about open spaces, parks and stuff like that, because that's what we think about when we say land, isn't it? But uh, most urban land is under buildings, and it's what gives those buildings their value. It's not bricks and mortar which makes houses so expensive. It's the speculative value of the land on which they sit. A value which the owners of this land do not create. It's created by the infrastructure provided by government. It's created by the economic activities of other people setting up their businesses and the rest of it, all of which makes a location desirable and raises the value of that land, which is then pocketed by the person who happens to own it. And when you're looking at you know, these very rich, um, big property owners owning big chunks of urban land, they're making millions and millions every year from our economic activities. Uh, and they just sit there and harvest it. They just fill their pockets with other people's work, in effect. And so the answer to this, I believe, is land value taxation. That aim, uh, sort of highly progressive, very sort of clearly structured to um, aim primarily at the, the richest and biggest landowners in, 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 in the cities. Um, and um, land value taxation, I think, makes a great deal of sense in an age of great wealth inequality, when that wealth is vested to a very large extent in land. It's got the f further advantage that you can't move your land to Panama. Um, <laughs> And it has the further advantage that it generates a lot of money, potentially. So part of this money should be used by the state to fund public services and the rest of it, as per. But the residue, I think, should be divided up and passed back to communities. And communities would be encouraged to set up a, a trust to take that money. They would also be given various other um, elements of political help, such as, for instance, the community right to buy, of the kind they already have in Scotland, and possibly also a community right to land assembly. So you have this money, and you're allowed to use it to buy land. So what are you going to do? Is, you, know, you set yourself up as a community group in part of the borough, and you look around, see what comes up for sale. Oh, this casino has come up for sale. Do we need a casino? Is that the thing we need more than anything else? No, good, then let's buy it. So you buy the casino and you knock it down. And you say, right, what do we need here? Oh, yes, that thing called affordable housing. I don't mean affordable housing, I mean affordable housing. <laughs> <coughs> let's build an estate uh, with a large element of affordable housing. We don't want it sort of all to become a ghetto, so we want it to be a mixed development, but we want sort of, you know, um, the majority of the houses there to be genuinely affordable and a lot of them to be up for social rent. But we're not going to build this estate ourselves. What we're going to do is we're going to go to people at the top of the social housing list and go to people who are would-be owner-occupiers and want to put down a deposit and say to you, them, right, you've got this option of, of, of putting your names down as the future occupants of the estate which is going to be here. And then you are going to design the estate. We'll give you some professional help, you know, we'll give you expertise on tap for when you want it, but it's you are going to sit down together and you're going to work out what this is going to look like. You're going to design your own homes, but more than that, you're going to design the whole estate. And what we see all around the world is that on those rare occasions when people are allowed to design their own estates, they are a hundred times better than when you get some volume house builder helicoptering down their standard design again and again and again on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, which means a take-it basis because we've got no sodding choice. And, um, and, and people do things like, oh yeah, designing children in. So children have got somewhere to play, there's a novel idea. <laughs> Having houses which face each other, so you know, there's a sort of friendly atmosphere 
where actually you <coughs> do it so that as people come out their doors they might meet each other rather than just scurry into their car and drive away. All sorts of design elements where when you, when you tap into people's collective genius start to come to the fore. And you can obviously learn from stuff which has gone before and tap into the expertise as well. But you see this massively improved design. But in doing so, you do something else. Because by the time those people move onto the land, <coughs> they've already formed a community. They've been working together for two years. Probably hate each other, but, but, they, but they all know each other very well. And, and they will have to have worked constructively. So they actually have to get on with each other. So you've got this ready-made community and that, what a transformative impact that has rather than just filling up some developer's estate with you know, wh whoever, comes, whoever can afford to, to buy the houses. Um, and so then you've got this estate which is generating social rents coming back to the, um, um, to, 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 to the Commons Trust, which is now a Commons Land Trust that you've set up. You're still receiving residue um, from land value tax coming into your coffers as well. What do you do next? Well, maybe buy more land, build more houses. Maybe, uh, you know, and definitely if that's the primary thing, then keep doing that for a while. But then, you know, your money's still accumulating. You might want to set up some amenities, a youth centre, a library centre, a children's centre, sort of things which have been disappearing. Or you might want to issue a local basic income to the people in your community with that money, because it's a common shared and equal basis for the, 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 the product of, of your resources. Um, so you begin to see how through a series of measures you can have this potentially transformative effect within a community and transfer both power and money back to the people and away <coughs> from the elite. But of course for this to happen you need a supportive and enabling state. And almost nowhere on earth at the moment is there a state which is in a position to start doing that. So we need regime change. Democratically, of course, and peacefully. <laughs> and I think there's some very exciting new ways of achieving this. And I hark back in particular to the amazing thing that happened in the first half of 2016. Now you're scratching your heads. What possible amazing thing happened in the first half of 2016? Hasn't, haven't the past three years just been a total disaster? Well, <laughs> yes and no. What I'm thinking of is the Bernie Sanders campaign. And you say, well, now he's completely lost it. The guy not only, no, he didn't even get the Democratic nomination, let alone the presidency. Surely that was a failure. Well, something very interesting happened in the Bernie Sanders campaign. You could see it as a gigantic live experiment. And they only really got the answer in about the last four weeks of the campaign. And the people running it sort of rather frustrated. They say, oh, you know, if we had two more weeks, we would have got there. But anyway, it's incredible what happened. Because you start with this guy who had 3% name recognition, who was universally dismissed by the media as a total superannuated no-hoper. And rather importantly in a US presidential race, had no money. But, so he sat down with his two or three staffers that he could afford to employ and said, well, what are we going to do? What have we got? And they said, well, the only thing we've got is the enthusiasm of the people who want you to be president. And so some bright spark said, all right, well, let's start using those people. Let's try farming out some of the jobs which would normally be reserved for staffers, paid staff members, to volunteers. Ooh, that's a bit scary. You know, they're bound to screw it up. Well, we'll, we'll just try something small to begin with. And, ooh, ooh, yeah, they, they, they mopped that up. OK, we're giving something a bit bigger. Whoa, a bit, they bit my hand off. You know, they, they just take it, whatever you give them. And they suddenly started to discover that the more you ask people to do, the more people come forward to do it. It's sort of paradoxical. You think, oh, I can't ask, them, you know, I can't ask too much of them. You know, I'll just ask them, you know, one hour of envelope stuffing. You know, no one turns up. So I want you to run the campaign. Yeah, 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 we'll run the campaign. <laughs> and thousands of people started flocking in, seeing that they had meaningful, useful tasks to do, the tasks which staffers would normally do. And it began to roll. It began to proliferate. And then someone had the bright idea. What if instead of 
training all these volunteers ourselves, we use the first wave of volunteers to train the second wave of volunteers. Oh yeah, that works too. And then the second wave trains the third wave, etc. By the time the nomination process closed, they had recruited 100,000 volunteers who themselves had run 100,000 events and had spoken directly to 75 million Americans. They reckoned that with another three or four weeks, they would have spoken to every accessible adult in America. And not as a paid staffer with a clipboard saying, um, right, what do you think about this? But as someone saying, yeah, where you are is where I am. The shit that you're suffering in your life is the same shit as I'm suffering in my life, which is so much more powerful than having some paid person turn up. And what you saw with the Sanders process is it sort of started off like this, and then it started to rise, and then it just spiked up. And then the deadline, the cutoff came, and it was just at that point that he was going to overwhelm Clinton without, you know, two more weeks, and she wouldn't have stood a chance. And then I believe Trump wouldn't have stood a chance either, because with that rolling momentum which the Sanders campaign had developed by creating a political community, a politics of belonging within politics, this proliferating community, you, uh, he was, had tapped into something immensely powerful. So, I read a book called Rules for Revolutionaries by um, Becky Bond and Zach Exley. It's, it's, it's full of amazing stuff. It's not a very well written book, but it's really interesting. And very soon after reading that, Theresa May called the election. In, in Britain. Now, if you remember, the great debate at the time was, are the Conservatives going to get a majority of 100 or 120? That was about the only debate there was. <coughs> but I just read this book and I thought, well, why couldn't Labour do this over here? And, you know, maybe they would stand a chance if they did. So I made a video for The Guardian saying this. And, um, and you know, there's a good rule in journalism, never read the comments below the line. <laughs> but I have this fatal attraction, I can't stop myself from seeing what... And in this case, it was like, oh God, oh no, why did I talk about wishful thinking? Uh, you know, there wasn't a single positive comment. Every single one was, right, he's completely looped the loop now. <laughs> uh, Labour standing a chance at this election, that was utterly ridiculous. Well, Little did I know, and this had nothing to do with me at all, but even as I was making that video, Corbyn was talking to some of Sanders' organisers who he had brought over to Britain. And they used the big organising technique to, to galvanise the Labour grassroots and momentum, who started to do a very similar thing to what the Sanders organisers had done in just six weeks. And well, you saw the result. The biggest political surprise in British democratic history. Just an extraordinary thing. This um, party written off as a totally no-hoper. Um, their whole idea was that this resurgent prime minister was going to sweep in with this crushing majority and she'd be able to do whatever she wanted and would be strong and stable in the national interest forevermore. <laughs> well, we saw what happened. Now, it's my contention, ladies and gentlemen, that if we can pull together that big organising model, as they call it, the Sanders model, with a powerful new restoration story. We bring those two elements together, we become unstoppable. Thank you. <laughs>